If Easter had come just a week earlier or a week later, the reading that we have read this morning from the Gospel of Matthew would not have coincided with Father's Day. But here it is. Jesus' words challenge. They do not allow us to sink comfortably back into those pews that we have missed for so long. There are two tried and true principles of interpreting Scripture that can help us. Not necessarily to make this passage less difficult, but to help us get a grasp on it, or perhaps to help it get a grasp on us. The first is the law of love. This principle simply means that if you are reading a passage and it seems to be telling you to do something or to hold an attitude which is contrary to love, then you, you are probably missing something that is going on in this passage on a deeper level. An interpretation that leads to loving action is always closer to God's truth by a long shot than any interpretation that might lead to hate or malice or disgust. The second principle is that Scripture interprets itself. When a passage of Scripture is unclear to us, or if it seems to violate the law of love, one way of breaking open a life-giving and true interpretation of that passage is to use other Scripture to sharpen and clarify our understanding. So with these two principles, let us think about how our Gospel reading challenges us and what claims it makes on us today. Let's get one thing straight right away. The law of love, along with many instances where scripture commands us to honor and to care for our parents and the rest of our family, all of that clearly removes the possibility that Jesus is advocating actual actual hatred toward our families. Or that we have no responsibility to care for them. That's off the table. Did you hear that, kids? You're not off the hook. You're not off the hook for Father's Day because of this scripture. Just, you know, wanted to make that clear. This passage is a continuation of the one that we read last week. Jesus is sending his disciples out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. But before they go, he is warning them about the persecution that they will encounter. Jesus tells his disciples not to fear the ones who, is, who are going to persecute them because those who act violently in the face of good will never ultimately win. They can only harm the body. They cannot harm the soul, Jesus says. The real danger is losing your soul. And the ones most in danger of that are the persecutors themselves, the ones who actively or passively through intention or indifference, trample on the worth and dignity of others. Those are the ones who are in danger of losing their souls. Do not think that I come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring not peace, but the sword. Here we look to another scripture. Jesus was the one about whom it is prophesied, Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called the Prince of Peace. At Christ's birth, the angels proclaimed peace on earth, goodwill toward humans. Clearly, peace is central to why Jesus came and to what Jesus did. But what kind of peace? What kind of sword? Remember just a few verses before, Jesus tells his disciples not to bring a sword with them on their journey. That was what we read last week. Later in Matthew, when the soldiers come to arrest Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, some of his disciples decide that they're going to fight their way out. And one of them draws their sword, but Jesus tells him to put it away. For the one who lives by the sword will surely die by it. The law of love rules out the possibility that Jesus is advocating for physical violence. Remember that in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us 
that if we are hit on one cheek, to turn the other also. Scripture warns us again and again of the consequences of violence, especially violence done in retribution and revenge. What then is this sword that Jesus brings? The book of Hebrews casts some light on that sword. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joint from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Jesus himself is the word of God. Jesus himself is that sword. And the sword that Jesus brings is the message of Jesus, the message of the kingdom of God, the message of radical love. It is the message of a peace that is not like any other peace the world has ever seen. It is the message of absolute forgiveness, a message of taking up your cross, of losing your life for Christ's sake, so that in him you can find your life again. Jesus' message cuts to the heart. It galvanizes, it catalyzes, it makes us choose sides. In the process, it exposes the many of the sides that we have chosen for ourselves simply will not do. Race, political parties, hot-button issues, even our allegiance to this nation-state or to that nation-state, these divisions and distinctions are exposed by Jesus for what they are, finite, limited, already passing away. And the challenging, the painful, but the very, very good news is that if we are willing to take up our cross and be a disciple of Jesus, he will cut them away like a knife cutting gristle from the stake. My apologies to vegetarians. The sword of Jesus divides illusion from what is real. It it separates truth from lies. But the sword of Jesus is like a surgeon's scalpel. It is wielded by the great physician. All that is cut away is done so for the sake of life and healing and ultimate wholeness. Make no mistake, Jesus truly is the Prince of Peace. God desires to birth into this world a perfect peace and a perfect salvation, wholeness for all. But true peace cannot coexist with with oppression or injustice or racism or poverty of soul or body. When there is no justice, there can be no real peace. And so this side of the day of judgment, the kingdom of God's peace is always going to cause conflict. It is always going to divide families and loyalties. God's desire is not for broken families. Neither is it God's desire that we have enemies at all, whether they are family members or others. In fact, God wants to make our enemies into our family. God longs for the time when we all become one family and we finally put away our swords of hatred and malice. But in order to get there, our loyalties sometimes have to be shaken up. We have to be confronted with our own inconsistencies and the ways that our unhealthy relationships contribute to evil in this world, our little concessions to violence and to hatred. Some things in our lives need the skillful hand of a surgeon. God did not come to save us from conflict or discomfort. God came to save us from a false peace behind which so much evil can hide. God came to save us from a false sense of security, founded in the delusion that we do not need each other, or that we can treat people however we want, with no regard for their dignity or worth. What needs to be cut away from our lives by this fierce and terrible sword of God's love? This question is thrown into high relief for us, in the circumstances in which we find ourselves and this society. This pandemic that we continue to live through has revealed some things to consider. 
It has revealed how our society is only as strong as the weakest and most vulnerable. It shows how our entire nation will be judged by how we treat the poor and the elderly. It shows that an economy based on scarcity forces us to choose between death on the one hand and death on the other. It reveals just how reliant we really are on each other, including, maybe especially, on those that we don't particularly like. How is the sword of Christ's love and mercy and justice at work in these times? How is God calling us to change ourselves and our communities in light of the inconsistencies and the injustices that have been revealed? Again, the death of so many black men and the protests over these last three weeks, whatever you think of those, they reveal that we have made a false peace with racism in this country. They reveal that systemic problems resulting from 400 years of violence and oppression cannot be swept under the rug and be expected to stay there. Everything hidden must be revealed, Jesus says. How is the sword that is the word of God at work in all of this? What cancer is Jesus offering to cut away from us? Taking up our cross and being a disciple of Jesus constitutes a new family, a new citizenship, a new reality. It constitutes a new path toward real peace and real justice. This is the theme of our Romans reading. Our baptism constitutes a death to this world so that we can rise again with Christ into a new world, a new way of being, so that we can walk a new road. It is a path that begins and ends with a God of self-sacrificing love. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for Christ's sake will find it again. Amen.